Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Inglebard. Every once in a while, you just get a wild itch that needs to be scratched. You know what I'm saying? Oh dear. For the last three years or so, I've wanted to check out a single board computer running on the Amlogic S905X system on a chip processor. In particular, I've had my eye on this computer that was originally launched on Kickstarter a few years back as Le Potato, which you can roughly translate into English as The Potato. How can I not want to try out a device that is literally billing itself as The Potato? The Libra Computer AML S905XCC, yeah, that's its official name, is an SBC that uses the Raspberry Pi 3 form factor and matches it more closely than most competitors. And hey, check out that snazzy white PCB. Kinda looks like someone spilled milk all over a Raspberry Pi 3. But it's kinda cool, I guess. You can also get an eMMC memory chip for these things for faster drive performance. But I didn't. I picked my device up on Amazon with a coupon, so ended up getting the 2 gig model for like eh, $25 or so. This was $45 when it was first released about three years ago, and is typically quote unquote on sale these days for $35. I'm using a Raspberry Pi 3B case for my Le Potato, and it fits in perfectly with zero issues. For anyone familiar with my channel knows I like to take a look at devices like this and see how they handle retro gaming. So this is not going to be a general review of the Le Potato board as a complete product or anything like that. I'm just going to load up the newest official available version of Laka and see how it performs with a whole bunch of old game systems. The problem is that the version of Laka that's officially available for this device is a few years old at this point. In fact, if you head over to the Libre Computer's website for this device and look at all the available operating systems, there aren't any that have had a release since mid-2019. So software and OS support? Not great. But hey, just because the hardware and software are a few years old doesn't mean we can't be pleasantly surprised by its performance, right? Right? <sighs> Quick side note, I checked out other images of Laka built for similar hardware that were based on newer versions of the OS, but I wasn't able to get any of them to run on the potato here. I'm definitely no expert when it comes to these things, but I did some research on the old interwebs, but I just wasn't able to get any other versions up and running. If you're smarter than me and have done that, I'd love to hear how you did it, what image you used, and some instructions to get it going. I'd be happy to do another video if using a newer version of Laka made a notable difference in performance. Now as for RetroPie, which is also available for this device, I'm not going to mess with it, but I mean it's cool that it's out there if that's your thing I guess. Okay, here's a look at Laka. Note that the newest version of Laka available for this thing is version 2.1 which, as I've mentioned, is a few years old at this point. So what's the big deal? Well, you lose out on some handy features that you might be used to in current versions of Laka, particularly super easy external drive support. I mean, personally these days, I love being able to install Laka on things and then just take an external drive with games on it and transfer it from one device to the other in a completely seamless fashion. That's not something that you can do with this board. As a note, I'm using a wired Xbox 360 clone controller to ensure that no extra lag is introduced from using a Bluetooth or a 2.4 GHz wireless connection. Now then, how does the S905X CC or Le Potato run? Let's take a gander, shall we? We'll start things out in a positive way. Look, you can run NES games. Here's Contra. It works, it performs like you'd expect. Oh, and here, watch me play a little NES Tetris, seeing how many lines I can get without rotating any pieces. Spoiler alert, the answer is... not many. Next up, how about a fresh helping of Game Boy Advance? I'm not gonna waste a lot of time here. The few different GBA emulators included in this build of Laka perform just fine. Here's Castlevania Aria of Sorrow running on GPSP. Yeah, it runs fine. Want to see something that doesn't run fine in GPSP? Here's V-Rally 3. It's missing the background and the transparencies in the HUD and the smoke. But if we fire up MGBA, it runs just fine and all the effects work much better. 
It's been a really long time since I fired this game up on real hardware, so I'm not going to claim that it's perfect on here, because frankly, I just don't remember, and I'm not going to go digging out my cart and my Game Boy Advance to test it. Maybe full-blown home 32-bit CD systems are more your thing. How does PlayStation run? Well, it runs like this. Here's Clonoa. Yep, it's fine. No issues. No complaints. Likewise, the 2D Gradius Guidance Gradius. runs just fine as well. No problems at all. Next up, how about a little Raystorm? It works! Amazing, right? No? Well, it works anyway. So yeah. PlayStation generally seems to run okay, but performance may still vary a bit depending on which game you're running. Now here's Sega's mushroom-shaped disaster, the 32X. You know I love a good session of Space Harrier, so here's some Space Harrier. It looks and runs like it should, except for one thing. Just like on the Raspberry Pi 3, there's an awful lot of control lag in this game for some reason. It's way worse than playing on real 32X hardware. I'm not sure exactly why the input lag in this game is so particularly bad, especially since when we run Virtual Racing Deluxe, I mean there's some input lag detectable, but it's not nearly to the level that we experience in Space Harrier. And consequently, Virtual Racing Deluxe is much more playable and also runs at full speed. So 32X, yeah, it probably runs every game full speed, just you know, be aware that some games may not control as well as they should. Now we've got the Atari Jaguar. You might expect that Jaguar games would run terribly on an underpowered single board computer like the Potato here. Well, dear viewer, you're really good at expecting things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, just a few games to show you that it's completely unplayable. Just in case anyone wants to see if the Potato can run 3DO games for some reason, here's your answer. A resounding... yeah, but badly. Here I am playing Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. I use the term playing loosely because, as you can see here, this runs about the same speed as a turtle that someone shot with enough tranquilizer to knock out an elephant. I'll preface this bit about arcade games by saying performance will vary wildly depending on the power of the arcade hardware you're emulating. I always like to start out with Darius Gaiden since it's a 2D game running on some advanced 2D hardware with lots of effects that cause weaker SBCs or older computers to slow to a crawl. I expected the Potato to handle this game okay, but surprisingly it runs pretty poorly. Transparencies and alpha effects bring this game to a crawl on this device. I tried it in both MAME 2003 and FBA. Surprisingly, FBA runs this game considerably worse than MAME 2003. So here's a look at the arcade version of Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Why am I showing you Champion Edition instead of Super Turbo? Because it wouldn't even open Super Turbo, that game just crashes immediately. Oh well, this is better anyway. But at least you can get some arcade SF2 fix on here. Nintendo 64 is always a bit of an issue in one way or another for most cheap single board computers. And guess what? It's still the same deal here. You'll get some games that run okay, some that don't, and some that are inconsistent throughout. Mario Kart is an easier game to run, and as you can see here, it runs pretty well, at least using Mupen. Parallel is also available if you run into something that has issues in Mupen. Here's the much faster F-Zero X running at a glorious 60 frames per second on the potato. So, yeah, you can run some N64 games at either full speed or close to it, but expect lots of games to have issues, and few that are relatively problem-free. The last system I'll take a look at here is the PSP. PSP is always a bit of an odd duck, since performance varies so wildly depending on which game you're running. First up, we'll look at Darius Burst, and hey, it runs really well. 
It's not a huge surprise since this runs pretty good even on a Raspberry Pi 3B but has slowdown on that device. Here on the Potato, it doesn't even noticeably slow down during the full screen explosions and transitions. Honestly, I expected a little worse out of this, so I'm pleasantly surprised here. Next up, let's take a look at Wipeout Pulse. I'm showing you this one instead of Wipeout Pure because, well, Pure just won't run on this device. Anyway, as you can see, it runs like shit. It's super slow and nowhere near the speed of the game on real PSP hardware. And of course you could do things like enable frame skipping and tweak some other options, but nothing will get this game running in an acceptable fashion with this hardware. Here's Gradius Horarius 4 from the Gradius Collection. And hey, this one is perfectly fine and full speed, even with all the wacky effects in this game. So, nice, you can definitely play this game. Finally, here's Tomb Raider Anniversary. This one is unplayably slow. Weaker hardware usually has issues with this game, and the potato here is no exception. So basically, we have once again proven that PSP is a crapshoot on this type of hardware. You'll get some games that are fully playable, some that are a little bit slow, and some that are just unplayably slow no matter what options you tweak. Well, that just about covers using the AML S905XCC, or Le Potato, as a retro gaming device in the year 2021. Is it worth it? Short answer, no. Long answer, no. Seriously though, I mean it's a relatively powerful and inexpensive single board computer. The problem is that it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's got competition from other devices that cost the same or less and offer performance that's about the same or more and also have better software support. The only situation in which I could recommend picking up one of these devices is if you happen to find it on clearance for a really low price. Now another reason I wanted to take a look at this device now is that Libre Computer is getting ready to release a brand new single board computer based on a new rock chip system on a chip processor. So I really wanted to get a sense for what kind of support and what kind of operating systems were available for the devices they already had. And as you can tell, the support that they've had for software and operating systems has been pretty abysmal for not only the potato here, but also for the other single board computers that they offer. So because of that, I'm definitely going to be taking a pass on whatever new products they put out there. There's really no way to justify getting a device like this if it's not going to have reliable software support down the road. And so far, I mean there are no signs that Libre Computer is going to up their game on that front. Still, I would love to be proven wrong about this. So I will at least be keeping an eye on any new devices that Libre Computer puts out to see if there's anything worth getting in the future from them. So that'll just about do it for this video, my retro gaming friends. If you enjoyed the video, please toss it a like. If you haven't yet, please subscribe. And why not help spread the word about the channel? If there's anything you'd like to say or ask about this device or any of the others that I've covered, feel free to leave a comment. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.